Are you ready to take action to attain the lifestyle of your dreams? It's a great way to make a lot of money fast, fast, fast. Hey, what's going on, Clever Investors? Welcome back to the Clever Investor Show. I'm your lucky host, Cody Sperber, the OG Clever Investor. And today, in Clever Investor headquarters, we got a superstar. Probably one of the best sales guys, at least sales trainers on the planet. I say so. He says so. Is that what His mama saying? says so. You know, my grandma said, says that. Grandma yeah. says Grandma's so. Grandma's told me. We have the amazing Jeremy Lee Miner in the studio. Hey, Cody, thanks for- Founder of Seventh Level. Thanks for having me on the show. Now, I have to ask, is that what you say to every sales uh, trainer that probably walks in here? hundreds of thousands <laughs> of students have come through his program. He is the creator of the, is it N-E-P-Q -E yeah, methodology? Some, so my friend the other day is like, hey, can you tell me about the NEPQ? I'm like, NEPQ? No, it's any, okay, any PQ. Yes, the NEPQ, any PQ, yeah. Now, is it, this is like, and you know, I've heard yeah. of, you know, neuro-linguistic programming sure. and a bunch yeah. of different sales methodologies or sure. strategy. This is something you yeah. made up. Yeah, it is. Uh, so I went to college for behavioral science and human psychology, social dynamics, which is really the study of the brain and how the brain makes decisions. Why does it say yes instead of saying no? You know, so different things like that. A lot of boring science geeky stuff. Yeah, it's just, well, I mean, it plays perfectly <laughs> into what you do. I mean, sure. persuasion, influence. I always tell yeah. entrepreneurs, like, your number one job is to enroll. Yeah. Like, you just need to learn how to enroll everybody into your vision so that yeah. way you can go accomplish great things. And Yeah. It's a, it's about, you know, framing because, you know, I anytime I do a keynote or, you know, if, if somebody's a client, they'll, they'll know this by going through our portals and stuff. But I always say that, you know, if, if I had to describe sales in like one word, sales or selling, that word would be change because that is all you're doing. So it's about how good you are getting the prospect to view in their mind that by them changing their situation, okay? That means purchasing what you're offering, that by them doing that is, it's far less risky for them than them doing nothing at all, staying in the status quo, the problems stay the same and nothing ever changes. In reality, which is more risky, right? But it's how to reframe that person's mind to start viewing that because human beings don't like change. So it's, I always say selling is change, yet human beings don't like change, even though we say we do. And we don't like change because it's unfamiliar to us. We might like something, we might not like something, but we're more comfortable staying in the situation because it's more familiar to us compared to changing, right? Our situation because it's more unknown. It's like you, you've ever got a friend, uh, you, it's like a friend, somebody you know, or a business associate, and they're always complaining about the relationship they're in, like all the time. Yep. And you're always yeah. like, why do they stay in the relationship even though they don't like it? It's because they're human and they're afraid of change. So it's about helping that prospect overcome the fear of change. And that's really all what selling is at the, at the foundation of it. Well, let's talk about, you know, my audience is heavy investors, heavy real estate agents, sure. mortgage professionals, people yeah. that are entrepreneurial in yeah. spirit. You know, um, the reason I'm really excited to have you on the show is I think the number one skill you can ever develop more than the technical real estate stuff is yeah. the sales persuasion and influence. Skill. That's valid. Yeah. Because I mean, if, if you can't communicate, you're, you're not going to really win m many of those deals, are you? Yeah. And I was not, I was, um, I was an enthusiastic kid. I was uh, focused uh, and I was authentic, yeah. but I had no sit skills at all. And yeah. so my first nine months in the business was brutal. You're kind of winging it. Yo, I was more than winging it. I was, I, I was, I was floundering all over the place, and yeah. and I, I didn't do a single deal. It took me 14 months to do my first real estate transaction. Were you really excited when you called the distressed property owners? Like, hey, <laughs> you, so excited to talk so, to you. So so happy. <laughs> so happy to talk to you. Yeah. Do you have two minutes we can talk. Yeah. No, actually, my first <laughs> my first experience ever even trying to make a sale. Yeah. Was a guy handed me a list of pro properties in foreclosure. Okay. And was like, this is how we get deals. This is like uh, 2003. This is how we get deals. Yeah. And I remember, I'm like, wow, I got to like walk up to the door, mm. knock on the door of somebody in foreclosure. Yeah. Try to talk to them, get my way yeah. in their house and convince them mm. that this kid who looks like he's 15 years old, that ignore the shitty Nissan pickup truck in the driveway sure, that got right. me there. Yeah. Uh, that has real no money, credit yeah. card debt. Uh, I'm going to stop your foreclosure and save you from this problem and help you fix your credit and all mm. this stuff. And my very first time ever walking up to the door, first off, I, it took me 20 minutes to even get out of my car. Yeah. I was scared to death. Yeah, it, and then I went the whole way I'm walking up. You ever hold a piece of paper and you're scared? 
Yeah, it's it's because it's it's your brain has uncertainty with what you're doing, so your your ner- your nervous system, your yeah, you're I'm, yeah of- I was losing it, and the paper's like floundering and everywhere, and I'm like, oh my god, they're gonna yeah. notice this, yeah. So now I'm getting more nervous, yeah. And as I'm walking up to the door, I see the blinds open up like two inches, and this lady's eyes are just salesperson eating me alive, trying to sell me something. She, yep, and right away, as soon as I got up to the door, mm. she swings the door open before I even knocked and yeah. says, "Hey, kid." Uh, come back with your dad when you can help me and slam the door in my face. I never even got a word out of my mouth. Oh my God. I dropped my papers and I hightailed it back to my pickup truck. And I sat in there for like 20 minutes. I I was like paralyzed. I was crying a little bit. What do you think think caused that reaction from her in your mind? Because you're just walking up and say a word. People in foreclosure are bombarded. First off, you got to get to foreclosure. Mm. Every bill collector on planet earth. Like you're not just defaulting on your house. You're defaulting. Sure, yeah. You're every, getting, your life everybody's is. knocking on your door. Yeah. And yeah. so she's ducking and dodging and she's in this defensive posture. She's like in, she just wants to fight. Triggered fight or flight mode. Yeah. In her brain. And here right. I am, this little yeah. kid walking yeah. up, just yeah. one of a probably 200 people that have knocked on her door in the last few months. Cause the, yeah. uh, the foreclosure date was only like a week away. So yeah. it was like crunch time. Oh, and okay. so I learned a very sense. valuable lesson in that moment of, of how tough you got to be in this. Yeah business. You got to have a bounce back spirit. You got to, you got to have some skills. Like even if she would have talked to me, I would have had no idea what to say. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't prepared. I had no skills. Yeah. My only thought was, well, I'm supposed to go up there and talk to her. Yeah. And it took me 14 months to get my first deal. And, and along that journey, I I hired mentors. I met a, I met a guy who was a professional door-to-door salesman. Okay. He taught me the, he taught me some game. Door to door is all about pattern interrupts, about interrupting their pattern of what they're used to, right? Because if they view you as a salesperson with your body language and your tonality, you're instantly triggering fight or flight mode. So it's all about interrupting that pattern. Well, let's talk to some of the real estate agents and investors and mortgage guys out there. Like, yeah, like how uh, you, you probably train a ton of people we in do. our space. It's the, uh, so we train 161 different industries now. There's only 163 in the world. It's kind of crazy. And there's subcategories of each one, right? So real estates are second largest, but that would include like real estate agents, residential. That's a big one for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Ryan, you know, you know Ryan Serhant? Yeah, yeah, one of, of course. Our clients? Yeah, yeah. Endorse my my book and everything. Love Ryan and everything. Uh, he's a good guy. So, and we commercial real estate and then your space, you know, real estate investors calling distressed property. So somewhat familiar with it, yeah. So how do we take somebody who maybe doesn't have sales skills? They're 23 <clears throat> year old Cody. Yeah. Where, where do we start? Well, first of all, for 23 year old Cody, uh, you know, I can give you, and I love, here's the thing. Like, I think people feel like I hate personal development. I love personal development for personal. That's why it's called personal development. Cause a lot of people think like, oh, if I read a book about like personal development, I'm somehow going to magically sell more. Now, personal development will give you thicker skin, but when the prospect says hello, when you knock on that door, let's say you're cold calling and they say hello, if you don't know what to say, if you don't know what to ask, you don't use your tone to get them to let their guard down, all that personal development just went out the window really quick because the prospect doesn't care about your personal development, right? So selling is all about the words you're using. It's all about your cadence and your tone, right? And the questions you're asking that either causes the prospect to open up emotionally, let their guard down, or you're triggering fight or flight where they go surface level and try to get rid of you and or give you vague, generalized surface level answers to your questions. So if I train the 23-year-old Cody, those skills, right questions to ask, how to use your tone, that builds certainty. See, you wouldn't have had the the scared feeling when you went up to the door if you were certain in your skill level. I always say skill level breeds your confidence. You can't have confidence if you don't have the skill level to support that. And, and vice versa. Like, it's like a neurosurgeon, like you go to half of school and somehow magically they let you do a surgery. You're not going to have much confidence. You're going to have uncertainty because you don't know what you're doing. So 20 year old we treat you those, those skills that would breed that confidence because you're actually having success. You're not getting somebody to slam the door in your face. And that breeds confidence and that internally motivates you to keep going. I, I think about it reverse ways than maybe some people do. Yeah, I mean, you know, like a lot of us, when, when we think about selling, there's like an old school kind of approach to mm. it. I feel yeah. like a lot of sales trainers- It's you know, still there. It's like repackaged, it's pretty bad. Yeah, and what makes yours different? Well, I mean, I, I'm biased. Uh, what our clients would probably say would make us different is that we're, and we'll, I can show you some stuff today. We're, we're, we're with my background, we're, we're training you how to get the prospects to do all the work. 
Whereas typically traditional sales training is going to teach you that you got to do all the work, right? So I want to learn how to work with the mind. I want to work with what I've already got. So a lot of people might say, you've heard this, like if you get the prospect to say yes, seven times or 73% more likely to make the sale, there's actually no data on that. It's just a sales trainer that made that up in the 1940s, put it in a book, I kid you not. And it's been repeated a hundred different times. There's no data that shows that because in certain contexts, I'd rather get, I'd, I'm, would want the prospect to say no because it actually leads to the yes, right? So instead of saying like, would you be open to blah, 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 I might say, well, would you be opposed to having a conversation around that? No, I'm not opposed, right? Or would it be, I mean, would it be completely unrealistic if we talked about X, Y, Z, right? So I'd rather have them say no because that typically opens up to the yes. So in certain contexts, I want them to say no more to yes. So our clients would say, you know, here's how we view it. Who has the problem or problems? You are the prospect. The prospect has the problems. In your case, that distressed, you know, that owner of that house that's about to go into foreclosure because maybe they got divorced or maybe it's a landlord that, you know, the tenants aren't paying and they're just sick and tired of it and they want to retire and move to Florida with their grandkids. Like they're the ones that have the problems. Now, who has a solution to solve that? You do. So why are you qualifying to them? You have to, we have to learn. So what we teach you is how to get the prospect to qualify to you. Now, I don't mean, because some people, when I say that, I don't mean like, you know, in the conversation, like, well, if this is a good fit for us, we'll tell you, like, if we're going to do it for you, like nobody believes that shit. Like, it's just old school. It, 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 you, you, you don't have any trust that way. So we're getting, we're going to teach you to get the prospect to do all the work. We're going to teach you how to get the prospect to sell themselves. We're going to teach you to, we're going to teach you how to how to get the prospect to overcome their own concerns and how to get the prospect to pull you in. Typically traditional sales training, not all, but most is you got to do the work, you got to do all the convincing, you got to do all the chasing, all the selling, you got to overcome their own objections, and that burns out most people because you're going to play the numbers game. See, top 1% sales people like when I was in sales and I made a few people would say a few dollars as a salesperson. Um, I didn't view selling as a numbers game. I never understood why people said that. I think it was a field goal, th like the sales manager told it to the new guys to make him feel better because they they sucked at selling. So like, hey, just it's a numbers game. But the problem is, is that when you have that mentality and you're teaching your reps, it's a numbers game, they don't work on their skill level. So they just go through the numbers because they think that's what it is. I'm focused on the skill level because I want to focus on the quality of each conversation and tweaking that where instead of, let's say if I'm cold calling uh, for your industry, instead of talking to, let's say a hundred people to book, you know, eight appointments, I'd rather talk to a hundred people and book 60 or 70 appointments. Because once again, I'm not the one that has a problem. So I want to focus on the skills game. It's like, I always say this, uh, do you watch the NBA? Uh, I'm going to the Suns game tonight. Okay, who's your favorite player? Yeah, probably Booker. Yeah, Booker. Okay, so imagine if uh, Kevin Booker in high school was like, oh yeah, basketball is just a numbers game. Just shoot as many times as <laughs> yeah. you can. Eventually you'll hit one. You, you know, he wouldn't have made his high school basketball. You, you, you shoot as many threes as you can. You'll hit one out of 20. No big deal. He's focused on, he knows it's a skills game, right? So that's why he's practicing every day. He's focused on his his wrist movements and how his elbows lined up with the basket. He's focused on his, his hips, his legs, his ankles, because he knows it's a skills game. And that's why he gets paid tens of millions of dollars a year as he should. So in sales, if you start focusing on the skills game and learning the skills game, the numbers game, it just doesn't, it's just a different way of viewing sales. So that's, that's so what's the framework like of your, cause a lot of your stuff is just asking questions and it like, it almost seems like a motivational interviewing type approach where it's like, Hey, I'm going to ask you all these questions and I'm going to work through like maybe a framework to get to well, a, a yes. It's a framework, but it, it's where the prospect doesn't feel like their sales questions. Cause that's a difference because if you come across like you're interrogating a prospect with like a series of like 30 questions, your prospects are going to be like, well, Hey, enough of the questions. Just tell me, tell me your offer. And I'll tell you if I'm interested, you're going to trigger that reaction because they feel like they're interrogated. So it's all about how you use your tone when you're asking the questions where it sounds like it's a conversation between two people that have a lot of trust from each other. And that causes the prospect to let their guard down and emotionally open up. Whereas if I'm just asking surface level questions, like a telemarketer, I'm going to get vague, generalized surface level answers and human beings by and logic or emotion. It's hundred percent emotion. Like I, right. There's no decision that you, you can make as a human being, it's your brain without your emotional side of your brain. Like here, let me give you an example. I feel like, having a drink of water. I feel like 
answering this question for you. You feel like interviewing me today. Every, every decision you make starts with your emotional side of your brain. And so I think a lot of salespeople that just, you know, they have a series of questions on the script, but I hate to tell you, your prospect doesn't play the same ball game as you. They're not scripted themselves. You know, the script will never go the right way you think it's going to go with the prospect. So it's everything from when you ask a question, how are you asking? Like, what tone are you using for that type of question? So let's, I'll give you an example for like a pattern interrupt. Um, you want me to give an example for your industry? I even brought it. You, you want me to show you a pattern up for yeah, your industry? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. You're like, oh my gosh. I yeah. even brought it here. I'm like, okay, I've got all these industries I'm training. So let me see this here. Oh, I brought this for you here. Um, ba, 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 ba. So what I used to do and what we teach a lot of people in your industry, especially real estate agents and investors, and I used to do this, uh, my second career was in B2B sales. I went from door to door, very successful at that in college to B2B enterprise where I'm selling like million dollar plus deals to fortune 500, fortune 1000, like CFO, CEOs, different things. So it's a different ball game. But when I would cold call, I always had like a, some papers in my hand. And I don't know how it just happened one day where I was like shuffling papers and I started slowing down my tone. I noticed that, that uh, the other person seemed like they were more curious or engaged. I don't know how to describe it to you, right? But in, in behavioral science, all you're doing is you're, you're triggering their brain to become curious. They don't know what you're doing. They don't know what's going on, but they're not getting off the phone. Because what I'm doing is I'm triggering enough curiosity where they can't be like, I'm not interested, if that makes sense. So with your industry, uh, do you have any papers? You guys have any papers? I can show you something here. Let me show you some papers. I'll show you a cool pattern. Tear, tear out two or three papers. Well, you came prepared, Finn. Well done. Finn's got notes on all his he's papers. Got he's notes. like, I ain't giving him he's those got, papers. I'm not, I got all those, my good, I'm not giving him those notes. You know, before we started, Finn, his, is that your manager? Yeah, he's my manager. manager. I, need, yeah. I need a crew. See, this is my challenge. Jeremy rolled in here all deep with a whole crew and he's like, this is my manager. Oh, wait, right hey. away, he, said, he, he elevated his status way above me. And I was like, I don't have a oh, manager. Stop. What the hell's oh, going stop, on here? But, but Finn asked me some yeah. really great questions. You're How old are you? 22? 22 years old coming, you know, because Jeremy gets in the door of all these cool places. Finn took full advantage of it, started asking me all these dope questions and made all these notes. And, no, all right, cool. so we got some paper. It's so true because like when we go to keynotes, we usually go with like eight to 12 people. You know, we go with, uh, you know, we got a videographer there. Sometimes we bring like second, like a vlogger, you know, we'll uh, roll in with like four or five account managers. People have questions about our training stuff. And then I've noticed that, you know, because when I first started doing keynotes a couple of years ago, just be me and videographer, you know, yeah. people didn't pay attention as much. Yeah. You roll in with like seven, eight, 10 people like, whoa, who's, who's that dude? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit different. So there you go. You're welcome. Okay, so I started noticing when I was like, when I would slow down and I would almost act confused. Jeremy's got a, a stack of papers. Yeah, I got a stack of a couple right papers here. here. So, listening. Cause I, and here's where I started learning about pattern ups because my first job, I sold home security systems door to door when I was in college for a company called Pinnacle, then went over to what's now called Vivint, you know, Salt Lake City. They're massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah Vivint Center right there yeah. uh, where the jazz play. And, and they would teach you in the beginning, like, you knock on the door, you're like, hi, my name is, I'm with XYZ Company. And the reason why you're in your neighborhood was, and most of the time they're like, oh, not interested. Security, not interested, right? But, and I was like, well, why is that? But I started to realize that they were getting, you know, everybody was saying the same thing from all the home security companies. Everybody was saying the same thing. Uh, they were selling pest control door to door, lawn care services, uh, anything that was sold door to door. Hi, my name is, I'm with XYZ Company. The reason why I'm here. So they weren't even hearing what I was saying it sounded all the same. So in their mind, I'm triggering them, their survival part of their brain to be like, oh, salesperson, how do I get rid of them? Like the alarm's going off with that lady, yeah. right? She saw you coming up there. Maybe you had something, she just triggered her. So she reacted that way, right? She didn't plan on doing that. Like, oh, when this kid comes up to me, you know, she didn't wake up that morning thinking there was gonna kid come up. It's just a reaction in her brain. So I'm like, how do I interrupt that pattern? I started learning about pattern interrupts in school and stuff. Like it's, they don't call it that, but it's, it's what you'd call pattern up. So then I started knocking on the doors and I, I would start angling my body off to the side, right? Where they had to come out a little bit. I wasn't so close. And I got this like clipboard, like a meter, like a, you know, like a, just a clipboard. They, they couldn't tell I was doing. I went and bought like a construction vest, like the orange ones huh. and a neon green one. I wore a, uh, like a, a tape measure here. Cause you gotta, you know, 
measure where the alarm's going to go, right? And I wore these like white old man New Balance shoes. You know, the white old man's. I'm, yeah. I can't wait to get into those later. You know, I'm picturing the whole get up right now. Oh, this the whole get up. I wore like a $10 Walmart watch, just basic as possible. Like you, when they came to the door, they didn't see me as a salesperson. They literally thought I was like a construction worker, meter reader. They didn't know what's going on. But I anyway, I had this clipboard here and I was like writing on it, like I'm doing a survey or something. And every time they would always come to the door, nobody ever like, hello, who's this? They'd always come to the door. And I'm looking off to the side or, you know, maybe if I sold solar, maybe I'd look up at the roof or whatever I was doing. And they'd come to the room. I'm like, yeah, are you guys the, um, are you the, the, the property owners here? Like with a confused tone. Yeah. Are you guys the, um, the, the property owners here? And I always had a pin there and they're like, yeah, we're the property owners. What's going on? They'd like lean out of the door. That's an example of pattern rub. So I'm interrupting their pattern where they don't even view me as a salesperson. Even if I said the same thing after, I've already triggered enough curiosity to get them to engage. So when I got into B2B sales, when I was cold calling companies, it was a different ballgame because I had to learn how to like navigate through the organization. And there wasn't just like, you know, the husband and wife making the decision. You have like maybe seven other decision makers, and then you'd have uh, maybe four or five other people that could influence the decision makers. So you had to learn how to navigate through everything. But what I started learning in cold calling is everybody cold called these companies all the time, selling what I was selling, selling janitory services, selling carpets, selling whatever all the time. And they all sounded the same. Hi, my name is, I'm with XYZ company. The reason why I'm calling you was, and they weren't hearing that. So I started doing like what the company would teach you how to do. I'm like, that doesn't work. I need to go back to the pattern reps. So it took me a while, uh, but it make a lot of money. But here, you want to pattern up for your space? Yeah, I would love to. Okay. One. Let's see if I can get the right tone here. Now it's all in your tone because I'm going to talk about this before I do this. If you, with what I show you right here, if you say it really fast, or if you say it in one monotone voice, or if you're really high pitched and excited, you're going to trigger sales resistance because the prospect doesn't hear necessarily the words you're saying immediately. They, their brain is interpreting your tonality. Okay. So uh, you ever read a book that says 93% of communication is by your nonverbal communication? Sure. Everybody's read that body language and tonality. Has anybody trained you on any of that? Probably not. No. No, nobody does, right? So with, with your tone, um, I have to get them to engage very, very quickly. So I have to slow down, almost act, especially on cold, almost like I'm confused. And a lot of times when I say, you got to use a confused tone, people like, you know, if, if, they, if they ever do a reel, it's 60 seconds. You, you, it's hard to judge a reel because it gets edited. You don't know the context before, after. You know how it is. You get sure. some of those people like, yeah. what? He said that, but they don't know what was said before, after. And so you're not saying like, oh, I'm confused about how my product works. That's what I'm saying. But I'm trying to trigger their brain to like slow down and hear the words I'm saying. Okay. So I, you know, let's say I'm called. Yeah. Is this Sally? Uh, hey, yeah, Sally. Hey, it's uh, Jeremy uh, Miller with XYZ Company. I'm holding a copy of your, um, uh, your property taxes on your uh, 555 Willow Lane property there in Savannah. And I was wondering if you could um, uh, possibly help me out for a moment. Now, you see how I slowed down? I'm acting confused. I'm shuffling the papers. Well, who's hearing the papers? The prospect. And notice now, I'm holding a copy of your um, your property tax records on your home at uh, 55 uh, Willow Lane there in Savannah. I was wondering if you could um, possibly help me out for a moment. No one will hang up on you because you're holding a copy of their what? Property tax records. It's very hard for them to be like, I'm not interested. Right. And when I say I'm holding it, I'm doing this so they can hear yeah, it. That was brilliant. You You're see, peaking curiosity. Yes. They're, they're, they're not expecting that all. Nobody's ever done that to them before. Probably. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now that's the first part. Now notice my tone sounds a little bit confused when salespeople call. They're like, yeah, Sally, is this John? Yeah, John. Hey, I'm with XYZ company. Uh, the reason why I'm calling you is I'm holding a copy of your property taxes on 55 Willow Lane. And I was wondering if I could have two minutes of your time. No. No, because yeah. you're saying it so fast. They have no time to internalize what you're saying. They're just hearing your tone. So what happens is it goes into what you, your survival part of your brain. A lot of people call it uh, your reptilian part of your brain. And that part is your survival part of your brain. And it hears the tone first. It does not hear the words. So it's like your, your defensive mechanisms. Okay, so if you're walking across the street and let's say somebody yells, like a lady just yells. Okay, you're going to be like, you react first. You're like, 
you know, what's going on. And instantly that noise, her tone goes from your survival part of the brain that just caused you to move. Am I okay? To what we call the midbrain, which starts interpreting the words. And then it goes to your neocortex part of your brain, which is your problem solving. And it's like, oh, oh, I, I'm okay. She's just yelling at her kid to be safe crossing the street. That's how your brain goes, but it hears the tone first. So you get a lot, you ever get telemarketing calls back in the day? Oh, all the time. And within 10 seconds, you're like not interested. Mm -hmm. You probably didn't even hear what they were saying. You know what trips me out about nowadays? And I love everything you're saying right yeah. now. By the way, this is gold. Well, you know, it's every story, single person stuff, listening you know? to this needs to steal that concept yeah. and try it immediately. I'll, sh I'll show you more after this. Yeah, yeah. I want to I hear some more. But like, you know what trips me out now? Yeah. I get these robo calls where it takes like five seconds to connect. Like right. it's like these auto calls. And then it like, then you can definitely hear they're in a conference like yeah, yeah, in, yeah. A, in a telemarketing center. Yeah. And I'm like, there is a zero <laughs> negative percent chance that this ever works. Like I know. how do they ever get through to anybody unless you're just Numbers like, game. <laughs> yeah. It's so Even expensive. that, like I'm it's just- It's so expensive for It's mind boggling man. to me how bad it is nowadays. Cause there's no skills game. Like if, even if they just did that alone, what I just showed them, they're going to get more people. Right now, so every time I was wondering if you could, uh, yeah, possibly help me out for a moment. Now, here's what the process said. They're like, uh, yeah, sure. Or you have a, some my property tax records, or who is this again? That's fine because I trigger the engagement. Then what I'm going to do is I have to push them back a little bit. So I want to push them away because I want them to pull me back in. And here's why: salespeople are always doing what? Trying to push, push, push. Trying to convince, convince, convince. I'm trying to push them away so they view me as a higher status that I don't necessarily care. Not that I don't care, but I don't need their business, if that makes sense, okay? Because salespeople don't do that. They need the business, they're need. They're always chasing, following around. So then I'm like, well, and I'm not even sure if it makes sense for us to talk. I, I represent a group of buyers um, that are they're purchasing like five or six different uh, properties, like in your four block area where your real lane property is. And after looking, they had me go through like your property uh, uh, taxes on the document. And after looking through it, they wanted me to call you to see if you would be uh, maybe a, a, if you'd be opposed to having a, a brief conversation on the property, would you be opposed to talking about that? Now, notice the first thing I did, and this is, you know, not, well, and I'm not even sure if it makes sense for us to talk. See, that's a technique to disarm them. I'm pushing them away. Well, and I'm not even make sense. I'm not even sure if it would make sense for us to talk. Okay. Just, it's a way to get them to let their guard down, push them away back. Right. So when you do that, you'll notice that they're just more open because you don't necessarily need them. Well, I'm not even sure if it makes sense for us to talk. I represent a, a group of buyers. Um, they're looking at five or six different properties in your area that they're wanting uh, to develop. And after they had me look at your uh, property tax records, they wanted me to reach out uh, to see if you'd be opposed to having a brief conversation on the house. Would you be opposed to that? You know what they'll say? Most of the time, well, they'll say one or two things, about seven out of 10 times, because we have this tract with companies that we train that do this. They'll say, no, I'm not opposed. What do you have in mind? Now, why would I want them to say no on a cold call? What is their brain already wired to say? No. No, yeah. So I want them to say no. It's hard for them to say, yes, I'm opposed. It's very hard. But if I said, would you be open to that? It's easier for them to say no. I love that. You see the difference there? Oh, yeah. Would you be opposed to having a car? No, I'm not opposed. They'll be like, no, I'm not opposed. What do you have? Okay. Or they'll say, well, it just depends. Like I've had a few people calling me about, oh yeah. And Frank, you know, you know, with us, you know, you know, it all depend on like, you know, the condition, you know, you know, and just so you know, John, we might not be able to help you. Like it all, it's all, you know, have a few questions around the condition of the home. Uh, you know, maybe what you're looking to get out of it, uh, just to see if we can do something good for you, because in the end of the day, it might be better for you just to keep the property. Are you with me on that? There are guards down. Because yeah. I'm saying, at the end of the day, it might even be better for you just to keep the property. Why does their guard come down? Because I'm saying I might not be able to help them. I might not be able to do anything good for them, okay? Now, their guard goes down, right? The trust goes up because I'm not desperate. Now, do I know I can help them? Yes. Do they know that I can help in the first 20 seconds of a cold call? No, because I have zero trust and credibility. So my first job in any type of sales situation, whether it's inbound leads on Zoom, uh, you know, outbound leads on a phone, in person, in a home, doesn't matter, door to door, is to get the prospect to let their guard down. If I can get their, them to let their guard down, 
then I can get them to trust me more and start building a gap from where they are, which most don't even know where they are, what their real situation is, to really where they now see they can be. And so by the end of that conversation, now they're like, oh my gosh, of course I would want to get an offer on this home because they, I help them like see the problems and relive their pain of those problems, right? And a lot of salespeople, you know, like when we do an events or sometimes we'll have these, you know, client masterminds or whatever, or, or, you know, training calls. And they'll be like, Jeremy, I just, I have a hard time. I just feel guilty about, you know, getting my prospects to feel pain. And I'm like, well, if you can't help them relive their pain, there's no sale. Because what are the two biggest emotional drivers that causes a human being to want to change? Pain or the fear of future pain? And if you cannot help the prospect start to relive the pain of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, bankruptcy or whatever, or have a fear of future pain, foreclosure, credits completely destroyed for 10 to 20 years, they don't feel any need to change. And if they don't feel any need to change, that's when you get objections. And that's why they don't buy. So it's my job, like I'm doing a disservice if I can't help them relive pain or start to see a fear of future pain because they don't feel any urgency to change. And that's where it all sales coming back to change. So many great lessons in there. Yeah, there you yeah go. that was a masterclass. At, at, well, you know, at, my tones, at, I'm a little bit, you know, a little well, bit warming up Well, it was great because you, you showed them an opener and then you showed them how to take their second step, yeah. which is, all right, yeah. let's 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 get them now pull, pushed away and then And I'm not even back sure in. if it even makes sense for us to, to talk. It's just, yeah, you know, push so them away. I, I do, um, I teach a lot of my students and we've been, doing like, just like a, a very um, easy way to overcome objections in our space yeah. is just yeah. like, if they, like, if you ask them like, all right, what's the mortgage on your property? Mm -hmm. And that's like a financial question that the guard starts going up. They're like yeah. stranger danger, you know, and if, yeah. if they throw back any objection, it's like, oh, I completely understand why you'd be hesitant to maybe want to share some of that yeah. information. It feels very personal or private, even though it is public and I can look it up. Um, I, I'm sorry if I crossed any boundary. I, I just, I know I'm about to hang up the phone with you and go talk to my business partner. They're going to ask me as soon as I get in the room. Yeah. And at the end of the day, my only goal here is to sharpen my pencil and give me the highest and best offer I possibly yeah. can. Isn't that what you want? Where do you ask the question at? Where, what part of the conversation are you asking? Uh, about this is more towards the middle. Um, like this is a, anytime yeah. they throw out a major objection, it's kind of like, I just go back to like, it's an easy way to teach a beginner. Like my job is just to sharpen my pencil and give yeah. me the highest and best offer I possibly can. Isn't that what you want? Or isn't that yeah. what you deserve? Yeah. They have to say yes, right? Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah. You're, it's an, okay, so once again, what's yeah. the mortgage of the property? Yeah. Just a kind of sure. a, a workaround because a yeah. lot of times that's like a big, a new student's big fear. It's like, what if they tell me, throw something out and I don't know how to overcome it. And it's like, all right, we're not at the yeah. point now where you we can teach you all the magical to, wordsmithing to, ways. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what would trigger that reaction because- is everything is triggered. It's a trigger reaction of a prospect gives you an objection. It's a trigger reaction in their brain if they don't want to give you that information. Usually that means that there's we get a couple like of things. surface level. We get, stuff, yeah. if, if we get, just give me the highest, the best price. Like just get at, get at it, right? Oh, yeah. Just tell me, tell, tell me what your offer is. Mm -hmm. That's a huge one because everybody's stuck on price. Oh, right? yeah. And so if they say that at the very beginning, oh, you got to agree. Like, oh, yeah, I'll go through all that for sure. I mean, it's really all going to depend on like the condition of the home, you know, the square footage, the X, Y, Z, and then really what you're looking to get out of the property uh, just to see if we, need, if we can do anything good for you. And once I know all those different details, I can give you a, an offer on the property. Would that help you if I did that for you? Same thing. Oh, yeah. you see. Oh, yeah. I'll go through all that for sure. It's all going to depend on blank, blank, and blank. And once I understand all those details, I can give you, uh, you know, rather than just giving you some random number that might not be good for you, I can I can give you a, a, like a solid offer. Would that help you if I did that for you? It's hard for them to say no. That would not help me. Yeah, I love that. And are you looking at personality types and like knowing like because like you were talking a lot about pace and tonality, and I mm -hmm. I think that's really cool because you know the first time I really ever thought about it the way you what you're talking about it is yeah. there's two books that changed my view on negotiation. Yeah. Um, Trump style negotiation by Bob Ross mm. and never split the difference by Chris Voss. Oh yeah. Okay. Two great books. And what's your, two, what's your book? Those are two completely different methodologies. I know, but what's, what, what's different. your book? I mean, I've read. No, what's your book? No, no, no. Oh. What, don't you oh, have a book? Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so our, our book that sells in like Barnes and Noble is called the new model of selling, selling to an unsellable generation.
Okay, so if I read that book, and I'd love to read your book, yeah, is it going to teach me tactical things, like kind of like what we're talking about it here will, today? It will teach you some, uh, but the problem with reading a book, books are great, right? But as you know, reading a book within, the way your brain works, within 48 hours of reading words, because there's no melody, there's no tone. Let me, I'll give you an example of this. Here's what I mean. Wh okay, what's your favorite song? Just a song you know that you sing all the time. Give me an example. Well, I don't really sing songs. Well, but all I know. The time, like but a song I mean, you I mean, think like, of. It could be Jingle Bells. I mean, hell, okay. I know Jingle yeah, I mean, Bells. I mean, I don't know. Song somewhere. I'm just trying to think of like a uh, song that I absolutely. Just a love. song in high school. Yeah, you know? I don't know. Some song by Queen. Yeah, okay. So Queen. Okay, Under Pressure, something like that. Um, could you rehearse a lot of that song? Like you have got it kind of memorized? I mean, could I? Yeah, like do you have it kind of memorized? Like if you started singing it, could it be like, you know, Maybe you know the it. lyrics? Yeah, you heard yeah. it. Okay, now. What's your favorite book? Let's just say Chris Voss' book. Yeah, Never Split the Difference. Okay, that's a good book. So uh, what page of that do you have memorized word for word? None. Do you know why? Because you can't memorize words when you read them, but you can, your brain can retain a song because of the melody and because of the tonality that you hear. In a book, your brain cannot retain that because you don't hear any tonality. You don't hear any melody. That's the difference between a book and like memorizing something else. So like if I'm a sales trainer, it's like a lot of companies will be like, hey, we want you to come in and do like a three-day workshop. I'm like, well, we can, but it just depends on what type of result you want. Because are you planning on bringing us back like every two weeks? Because when I leave within 48 hours, their brains are going to retain less than 19%. Uh, within seven days, they're going to retain about 9.3%. And within 30 days, they're going to remember less than 3% of what I trained them. So, you know, a book is the same way. Your, your brain doesn't retain it. So it's continually, that, that's why I have like virtual training portals. So you probably have that too. We have ours through like Lightspeed yeah. and then we have some through Kajabi and stuff. And it's constantly going through that on a daily basis, right? Listening to it all the time. And that starts to get the brain to retain that information. So, uh, you know. The reason I was bringing that up though, yeah. and I, 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 the first time I ever heard about like pace and tonality oh, yeah. and all yeah, that. Let's go back. That's good. Was like in those two books. It was like, okay, yeah. first with Trump style negotiation, they started talking about it a little bit. And then he really hammered it with the late night FM DJ voice. And I'm watching yeah. you kind of talk and I'm like, interesting. You are very methodical. You're very mm. slow. Your pace is yeah. like and it depends surgeon light. On, and it depends on the context. So let's say if I'm calling, let's say if I'm calling an out, let's say if I'm calling a, an outbound lead that responds to an ad, you know, you probably have SLO offers or whatever, right? Your, your team's calling them back. Um, I, I'm actually going to change my tone a little bit more than the cold calling because it's a different context. Cold calling, they have no idea who the hell you are. An outbound lead, they put in their name information, they're asking you to call back. So I might say, yeah, is this John? Yeah, John, hey, it's 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 Jeremy, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Miller. Yeah, we, uh, see, why do I raise my voice there? Yeah, is this John? Yeah, John, it's it's James, it's it's James Miller. Yeah, you you just responded to the the ad. You saw Cody talk about like investing in real estate. You asked us to call you back about, you know, look at different training so you can really scale your your business, right? Now, why would I raise my voice? It's James. It's, it's James Miller. What does that do to their brain? Yeah, that getting, implies that they should already know who I am. Yep. Yeah. Just, be, but if I don't raise my tone in that context, it could, Yeah, this is James Miller with Cody's. You know, it's like salesperson. Yeah, it's James. It's James uh, Miller. Yeah, you just uh, you responded to Cody's ad. You you bought the twenty seven dollar book on X Y Z. You asked us to call you back. See, I'm applying that they should already know me, so it builds instant trust. But I had to change my tone there. So there's, now, are you paying? Yeah. Oh wait. Well, I don't want to stop you on your oh. roll. Keep going. Well, there's there's five types of tone. Like if you if you want to be like the master, like you want to be really good at sales. Okay, I'm not talking like just making multiple six figures. If you're just a salesperson, let's say they're an investor and they want to scale their business times five, times times ten. Like you said, the best communicators are going to do that, right? It's not mm -hmm. necessarily getting the leads because a lot of people like in any industry, like oh my leads suck, and then we train them and they're like oh. It wasn't really the leads, it was me. I sucked. You know, the leads still have the problems, right? So there's five types of tones you really have to master. You've got the curious tone, you know? You've got, to, so uh, walk me through. What the square footage of your home? What, what was your home look? It's a curious tone, right? Uh, you've got the confused tone. So let's say uh, the prospect says, oh my gosh, yeah, this, this uh, the divorce is just really stressing me out. Stressing you out? See, that's a confused tone. 
So what happens, anytime a prospect gives you an emotional or like stress, tension, anxiety, frustration, I mean, do it with your kids. Just like frustrated? You just repeat it back with a confused tone and watch them like dump their emotions, right? But I have to use that tone because I'm like, hold, hold on, how do you mean by frustrated? I'm confused. So what the confused tone does to their mind, their mind basically says at that point, he didn't understand what I meant by frustrated. I need to explain that better. And so they start to expand and emotionally open up. But if I didn't use a confused tone there, they wouldn't do that. So my tone causes their brain to think differently, okay? I always say your tone is how the prospect interprets your intention behind everything you say and ask, okay? So if I'm, let's say you, uh, well, you've got younger kids. I've got teenagers. You're gonna learn this here in a while, right? So uh, let's say that you're upset with one of your kids. You're like, oh, I'm so disappointed in you. Now, how's that, what's that kid gonna do? I'm so mad at you. Your arms are out and you're like saying that with that tone, your kid's gonna get what? Defensive. But if I'm like, I'm so disappointed in you. Now, how are they gonna interpret that? That I'm disappointed because I love them, because I'm concerned for them. See where my hand is? It's a body language signal that communicates that compared out here. His hand is on his soft. foot, if you wanted to. Yeah, know. it's on the foot, no, right? I'm just kidding. Middle no, of the chest, right? It's on the heart, right? I'm so disappointed in you. See, that's gonna cause them to let their guard down compared to this, right? So then you've got, so that's, you know, the confused tone. Then you've got the challenging tone. But what happens if you don't do anything about this and you end up going into bankruptcy? That's a challenging tone. Now, I can't use a challenging tone in the first two minutes of a conversation because I don't have enough trust yet. They don't look at me that way. That's later on in the conversation with what we call consequence questions. And then you've got the concern tone, the tone that shows more empathy. What's really holding you back from moving forward? See, that's a concern tone. Now the prospect interprets it. I'm asking because I'm genuinely concerned about the consequences if they don't get rid of the property, right? And then I've got a playful tone. Ask me how I'm doing today. Jeremy, how are you doing today? Uh, you know, just hanging out, being the boring guy. What about you? See, that's a playful tone. Oh, just hanging out, you know, trying to stay out of trouble. Are you get in trouble over there? See, that's a playful tone. So there's certain contexts where I want to use the playful tone because it lightens the mood. It's more human, lets their guard down. So I, you know, I didn't learn tonality from sales trainers because nobody really teaches it. So I read the books like 93% and it always intrigued my mind. I was like, well, what do they mean? I was learning that in behavioral science, but nobody, nobody taught it. Like, well, what tone am I supposed to use for what questions? It didn't make any sense. So I hired uh, acting instructors that train me tonality, train me facial expressions. Okay, so yeah. let me hit you with some real shit then. Like, yeah. what would you say to somebody that says, oh, you're, you're manipulating people. You're so good. Yeah. You're manipulating the sale. Well, I, I guess I'm not the one that has the problems. The prospect does. So if I can't get the prospect to let their guard down, they don't get their problem solved. And to me... Um, that's pretty bad for the prospect. I just view sales differently. I never viewed it as like just money grab. Like I'm just out to make money. I viewed it as like, I'm solving this person or company's problem to get them where they want to be. And for me doing that, I get paid money for that. It's just a, a different way of thinking. Like I said, if I can't help the prospect open up emotionally and relive their pain of the problem, they don't feel any need to change. And if they don't feel any need to change, there's no sale. And when there's no sale, their problems are what? They stay the same. And they never get what they want. So I don't, I guess in, in all reality, like if I can't learn the skills to do that, I'm doing the prospect a disservice. And that's on me, not the prospect. It's not their fault. It's my fault. That was a great answer. Just have answer. a different yeah, way. No, that was, a, that was the yeah. perfect answer. I mean, I believe, you know, I've sold a little over a hundred million dollars yeah, in yeah. direct response. And I believe in what we do so much that it's my obligation. Think to of all the you. families like, you enrolling, saved their credit. I'm enrolling you if, if no matter what, tactic I use yeah. to get you there, I believe that it's so beneficial to you. That see I, how many, see how many families you've saved their, their financial future for generations to come because you saved their credit. I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah. You know, whether it was applying it in real estate or real yeah. estate education. Exactly. And see awesome. how many families you taught real estate education where they could change their families. And if you couldn't help them feel, you know, relive the pain of maybe their job or the career they don't want to be in, there's no sale. Their lives don't change. And, and that's like the butterfly effect to me. Like if I'm selling life insurance, like life insurance is the largest industry we train. Okay. If I'm selling life insurance, if I can't help that prospect, let their guard down and get the coverage they need to financially protect their family when they pass away 
And because it's not if, it's just when. When that happens and they're having to take the kids out of school, sell the house, move into a, a bad neighborhood, maybe, maybe they, you know, th- the wife has to get a second job now. Now the kids get into drugs. Like I think about all that, right? How that impacts them. It's like a butterfly effect. And it, it all comes back to the salesperson not knowing how to communicate. If they'd had that life insurance policy, none of that would have happened. So yeah. I, it's very personal to me. I don't know. You're good, bro. You're good. Oh, I can I'm not, tell. I can I'm tell. not that cool, but thanks. Um, for- all right. So let's talk like we got about maybe we'll 10 about, minutes yeah, left. Yeah, we got about 15. 15 minutes left. Yeah, okay. About- so I want to, I want to transition. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit personally. So you're, sure. you're, you're same age as me pretty much. Yep. yep. And With the old know, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have five kids. I do. Yeah. How are mm-hmm. you? Um, you know, we were talking a little bit before this, just, yeah. you know, it's hard being an entrepreneur, man. It's, it is, it's yeah. there's so much weight on our shoulders. There's so many people that we're, you know, in in some way, shape, or form responsible for. Yeah. Uh, just how how many team members do you have at your company? Uh, as of yesterday, because I just asked, 163. That's insane. Yeah, four years ago we had one. <laughs> <laughs> My assistant. You it. you were an assistant. Yeah, I love it. that. Yeah. Um. Uh. Well, let's start with today, and then I want to work backwards real quick. Um. Yeah. Just how are you doing right now with everything? Because yeah. I went through a divorce last year. My mom yeah. passed away last year. I went through a lot of life changes. Yeah. At, you know, kind of like this midlife crisis where yeah. like Cody 2.0 has yeah. been born. And yeah. I've been working really hard on like who this version of me yeah. is. Where are you at in your career right now? Like emotionally. I think, I think I'm kind of tired, man. Just to be real with you. Like I was really with you in there. Like I'm just, I'm, I'm exhausted. You know how it is. Like, especially when you're newer, you know, we're like the new kids on the block. Um, everybody wants you to go here, go there, this podcast, this keynote, this speaking engagement. Um, and I, I, I think I'm a little bit worn out sometimes. It's like my week, it's like I work seven days a week. It's like, there's no break. Like, you know, work Monday through Friday and then you're on a plane somewhere Friday because you get a big keynote for some mortgage company in Palm Beach, Florida. That's like on the other side of the planet from Scottsdale. And then you don't get back till Sunday night and then you go back in on Monday. And it's like, it's like the grind, you know? So I think, I think sometimes I'm just a little bit you know, exhausted. I'm going through a divorce too. I told you about that. It's been yeah. 18 uh, plus months. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I'm, we have a daughter together that we both love and adore and both being uh, good co-parents to her. And, uh, you know, there's feelings on both sides, but we try to remain friends, you know, if in that case, um, still partners in our real estate that we have together, but it's a, it's definitely a different dynamic because, you know, we, we were separated for a while before that. Uh, and a lot of people don't know this kind of stuff, you know? So, you know, I've, I've been dating, uh, you know, Kayla here for, geez, I, since like February or March or something like that. I kind of kept that a little bit hidden because I was worried about the public backlash, yeah, yeah. even though I'd been going through the divorce for like six, seven months before I even met her. But most people, these they don't know all that, right? They don't yeah. know all the details. And I didn't want to- I think that's respectable. Yeah. You don't want to hurt your ex or any don't hurt my ex, yeah. or anything like that. I, I struggle with that, being a guy on social media with a lot of followers. You're, yeah. You're, you, everybody expects you to have your shit together. Yeah, they do. To be the man. Like, you always have to, like, you're like this- yeah. Like you can't even be human sometimes, it feels like, because they're just ready to pounce on you. I don't think you, people realize that we're just, everybody, just all humans. Like, we just, maybe, maybe they're better at, one thing, I mean, they're probably better at something than I am for sure. Like I only know really one or two things. That's about it, that I'm an expert and they might be an expert in something else, but still human. But, you know, I was trying to respect my ex because I don't want to disrespect her because we have a daughter together. But then, you know, the new girlfriend, she wants to, you know, be, you know, nobody wants to be hidden. No one wants to be hidden either. So it's like, I'm right here in the middle and I'm just like, and, you know, everything else is going on work and stuff. So I think, you know, there'd be some weekends where I'm just like, I just want to curl up in a ball and like, I don't want to do anything for like three days. I just want to watch. Do you ever take time off like that? Or you just, because it sounds like you're burning the midnight oil. You have all this momentum. It's so hard to get momentum. And once you have it, you don't want to let it go. Yeah, for sure. And also, I I mean, this is just the real me talking is just like, when I stopped, that's when it all really sunk in. And it was just like, ugh, it felt so much better when I was just working. Yeah. <laughs> At least I, I, no, I was so busy that think. I couldn't even think about any of that stuff. Yeah. You don't have time to think, you know? So like, you know, we've uh, got my CEO here and, and we got a new chairman of the board, which is amazing. And, uh, you know, we're in these planning sessions like five hours a day right now for the next, you know, five to 10 year plan of, of where seventh level is going as a corporation. 
But then I still have to do all the other stuff. I still got to do the, you know, the training and we've got a big master class I got to put together for Thursday. And I'm like, you know, last night at like one in the morning, I'm still putting together the slides and stuff. You know how it is. And it's just like, then you wake up at five or six in the morning, you repeat it. So after a while, you just kind of get a little bit tired. You need a little break. So what would that do to the organization if you just had a midlife meltdown because you, you push too hard? I really like what I do. So that's, you know, I think when you like what you do, it just gives you the, the, the more ump to keep doing it, if that makes sense. Um, like there's a drive there that uh, it's just, I don't know. I was just, I don't know. Since I was like a little kid, I just had this drive, you know, like, you know that, I don't know if Steve Martin actually said it, but he's like, become so good that they can't ignore you. I was always like that in high school sports. I played college baseball as well, but I didn't grow up in a in a family that was really well-to-do or like had social status or anything. I always had to prove myself, if that makes sense. And so when I got into sales, my first job, I was like bottom man on the totem pole. First couple of months sucked because I didn't know what I was doing. And then within a year, I was the number one person. You know, now they have to pay attention. So I've always viewed that with anything I've ever done is like, you just, you just do your own thing. Just shut up. You don't talk about other people. You do your own thing you show your worth and eventually people, they just can't ignore you. But sometimes you just got to ignore, ignore that, like sit down and, you know, on a Friday night and watch ancient aliens and just not think about <laughs> it. You know? Like, like yeah. so that's what I like to do. I'm like, oh, I just want to watch ancient aliens and do nothing, you know? Well, with, with seventh level, are you guys going to become like a, like a Dale Carnegie type of company where you just are massive trainers in a bunch of different mm. spaces? Are you going to stay in the sales niche well we're you know yeah we're i mean we're still making give me, our give way me some insight of how we're, you and your yeah. corporate team are sitting around doing yeah. these planning meetings we're so we're you know i'll give you as much as i can right so you know we're we're trying 161 industries now there's only 163 so we're pretty much in every what are the other two? Like, salt like, salt mining is one that we don't no, you're, not, you're no, not big on salt mining, no, mining we, training. Well, we just don't know that we have clients. So the data doesn't show we have any clients. We're very massive on, we have a whole data tracking team. So we track all this stuff. I don't, I don't, I'm not smart enough, but you might, because you're a finance major, you maybe the data, but uh, salt mining was one of them. I can't remember the other one, but we just, we don't know that we have clients in that space. Maybe they bought something small, like a $10 book at Barnes and Noble or whatever, but you know, not clients. Yeah, that's yeah. Sense. interesting. But what what we've done is, you know, I knew the first five years of seventh level, we would be known just as a sales training organization. But I knew uh, during that five year tenure that we would be able to, you know, expand our reach with salespeople because right now we have almost a little bit over a million salespeople just on our email list from the last four years. We've got a couple million social media followers, which we're now starting to put more money into, like YouTube. We just never did any of that before. So now we're starting to put money into to grow that. So in about a year, uh, we're going to open up a staffing and recruiting arm mm, of seventh level. So we're bringing other partners in from other recruiting and staffing firms. I'm not talking about like a placement company where you charge a salesperson to get a job with somebody else. That, you got to have FTC issues with that. But we, you know, recruiting companies, you know, some of the largest ones make, you know, they they typically do seven to 12 billion a year in revenue. This is big business, you know, staffing firms. And so we're coming into this staffing industry. We'll always be a sales training company because we have to feed the beast. We get like 60,000 new leads in our ecosystem a month. And that's just, it just grows every month. It just goes up another five or 10,000 every month. So we got to feed that beast. And I started, you know, noticing even if, Several years ago, people are always posting our Facebook groups or email. I, I, I'm looking for a different sales job. I'm looking for a different opportunity. And then companies always come to us. Hey, we're looking for, we need 30 salespeople in our, you know, to sell medical device for us in, in Northeast, you know, Boston or whatever, just random stuff. And I was like, okay, we just don't have the infrastructure yet to be able to fulfill that. So we'll never, we will never as a company, we will slow down uh, if we can't fulfill something rather than just making a bunch of money and not getting clients results so that because it's bad for your brand yeah no we, i think it's great alignment yeah. with what yeah. you're trying to do and it's very scalable we, and exactly and so, sellable yeah exactly so because yeah. sales training you know the, the largest company in north america just if you're just doing sales training doesn't do a hundred million dollars who is the largest year. company in sales right training? now sandler institute they started sandler. 1971 yeah. uh, I've, 19, i have a lot of people that have taken yeah, 1971 you know a little bit of you know so anyway so and we're catching up to that, but you know, so we're like, how do we, how do we go to hundred million, then 250 million, 500 million, a billion plus. We can't do that just with sales training, but we can't just like, oh, we're going to sell, we're going to start a company selling T sets now. It's like completely different, right? So the staffing recruiting team makes sense because of all the salespeople in our ecosystem and employers yeah. and matching them together. And then the companies pay 
for those certified salespeople. So we're starting a big arm of that. And uh, eventually, you know, there's some other stuff we're doing with uh, business consulting. We brought in our new chairman of the board, um, Kim Manley, who was the uh, former uh, president of Smirnoff Vodka. Uh, so we're bringing in some like A players that actually have done the thing mm-hmm. we want to do. Cause I don't know what to do. Like I'm a sales trainer, right? Uh, a professional salesperson. And uh, we're going to have a different arm as well. More of the like uh, McKinsey model, Bain Capital models, business consulting yeah, yeah. and other areas as well. That's so cool. it'll yeah, it'll take a while. It'll take a while. That's big. That's big, yeah. big business. Um, all right. So let's end strong. Let's drive it home. I give you a hundred dollars. Yeah. I give Belf, Jordan Belford a hundred dollars. Mm. Give Grant Cardone a hundred dollars. And I give okay. Andy Elliott tight shorts and a hundred dollars. <laughs> Okay. I don't, I don't know. I, I've never met any I drop of those you guys. In, I drop you in a, a random city and I say, you got 30 days to sell, I don't know, whatever, vacuums. Whatever, okay. Whatever you got to sell. Hey, Who's right, going to come out hey, on top? You know, I don't, I don't know. Like I, everybody always, every podcast I get on, they're like, what do you think about Jordan Belfort? What do you think about Cardone? And now that's like, what do you think about this Andy Ella guy? I'm like, I don't know. I've never met them. I'm sure they're cool. I'm sure they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses just like we do. Uh, and they're always like, well, who's better? And I'm like, that's not for me to decide. That's like clients to decide. That's the world to decide. You, you don't see like, you know, Tom Brady, like I'm the number one quarterback in the world. Nobody's ever better than me. He just went out and performed and did his thing. And people can judge whether he's the guy or Peyton Manning or Dan Marine or whatever. And that's the way I've always viewed it. I'd, I'd always... I can't say that we're number one or we're this or they're this or that because it's not it's not me to judge that. It's it's not me to decide that. Like, yeah, grandma, maybe grandma thinks that Jeremy Miner and Sun Love are the greatest thing since whatever, but who cares uh, about grandma? It's it's up to society to figure that out. So we'll just step back. It was a very thing. humble answer. Well, it's Jeremy. reality. It's Jeremy, sorry, talk your man. shit right now. You I know, a, I know. You have an opportunity to talk a little shit. Everybody wants controversy. I just, I'd rather, you know. I'm trying to get this clip to go viral, Jeremy. Can you just talk some shit? <laughs> okay, if you ever, have you ever eat, read The Art of War? You know, yeah. it's like you you make your, say your enemies, or I don't, I don't really think they're enemies. I mean, there's 8 billion people in the world. We can't train all 8 billion of them. Yeah. You know, we have to have allies. And so I look at, uh, you know, if there's anybody that ever says anything negative, we have our, our PR people like, hey, why don't you come out and, and be on our podcast? And we're on the podcast and then an hour later, we're like best friends. Yeah. And now they're talking great things about you rather than me like, you know, spurning it like they suck, they're horrible. Now we're enemies. And now they say, you know, I'm just like, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to talk crap about people. I love that. You know? Well, I'm, I'm friends with all you guys and you guys yeah. are all badass mofos. I wonder so what I can... people say about me. Always the guy that has the two parts on the hair, you know. Or well, whatever, I mean, I know? think you're kind of like, they, 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 you know, you and Andy Elliott are kind of like newcomers. We're the new kids. The new kids that yeah. are the loudest and really. He's in, he, uh, he's in Scottsdale too. Uh, Fountain you know? Hills. Yeah. yeah, Fountain Hills. Yeah. yeah, you guys. Okay, I'm, so I'm going to make I'll fun. I'm going to make fun of you, Andy. I'm going to make fun of you. Why the hell did you put your office in Fountain Hills? There is nothing out in Fountain Hills, Arizona. <laughs> come on, man. You got to come you know to what's like interesting Tempe. about that? You got to come to Scottsdale. Fountain Hills, man. There's nobody out there. What's I went going out on? there and we were hanging out. That's like three hours from here. You know, he's got that army. Different with country. Him, right? Everybody's everybody's with oh, him. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. They own that town. The The city of Fountain Hills loves them. He's going to be the next mayor. He's going to be the mayor. He's going to retire. He's going to be the mayor of Fountain Hills. he's brilliant for doing that or- yeah. uh, um, you know, like you said, he's got to move. So I'm talking smack here. now, Andy. Why are you in Fountain Hills? There's my smack. You, you need know? to move here, Tempe. But we're looking at b- bigger office space. Here. We don't have, like, most of our people are virtual because their office space is like 3,500 square feet. We got 160 people. So they're all virtual. So we're looking at office space in Tempe, Town Lake, and then Biltmore yeah, area. Really great. So, you Get know. you close over here. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show, bro. I know you got to go. You got a big yeah. training thing going on next. Um, Thanks I- for having me on here. I've been following you for like a year and. It's, you got some really good stuff, man. Congratulations. Obviously, you know, you got some good stuff. You're just a dumb on. real estate guy trying to make, 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 make you're a little just, wave. You're just trying to help people. Little man. cheddar, a little fun. Help, you're just trying to help people and get some cheddar, cheddar from that. Help, I, help I a few people you. along the way. I love um, it. How do people get a hold of you? You know, if they want to learn more about what we do, you know, you can always go to barnesandnoble.com. You can get one of our, uh, well, our, only book that I've written uh, so far that it's not for clients. That's New Model of Selling, Selling to an Unsellable Generation. Uh, Jerry Acuff and I, he's the co-author, great guys, the CEO of Delta Point, big consulting firm on the East Coast. That's a great book, 17 bucks, barnesandnoble.com. 
Uh, if they want to learn about more of our training stuff, have them go to have them go to one of our larger Facebook groups, uh, SalesRevolution.pro. SalesRevolution.pro. There's hundred and. 120,000 people in there. We do. Sounds like community. They yeah, can that's go our get community. plugged in. And yeah, they plug their community. Free. They'll get some freebies, some you know, little stuff we get for free. I go live in there a couple of times a week still. And everybody's asking me like, you don't have time to go live. But I'm like, I really like it. And I think people want me to keep going live. So we going live to that community. So they go to there and just kind of learn about it. And if they ever want training for their teams or for their themselves, more industry specific, they can just message me in the DMs. I won't, you know, I'm not going to be the person responding. It'll be somebody on my team and tell them that you heard me on Cody's show and you're looking at uh, training for your industry and and they'll, they'll show you what we got. We got 36 different sales training programs now or something. That's great, man. Yeah. Well, Thanks for having me. Congrats on, on all your success, dude. I'm really I'm really proud of you. For It's really hard to do what you've done. And uh, I think that, you know, over the next five years, the whole world's going to know well, your name yeah. in the sales space. We and, do, and we do our best. And maybe even in the recruiting space we do. and the consulting space yeah, too. We, we do our best, man. We're just, we're trying to help people and companies along the way and have some fun. It's a lot of fun, man. You right. know, I like, I like coming to work every day. People think me, I'm crazy, you know, but I just- You definitely should, need to take a break. I like what I do. But you need yeah, to sometimes take, take a, break. a break. Smoke some weed, take a break, relax a little, <laughs> oh do something, gosh. man. Just chill out a little bit. Your team needs you and sure. your best version yeah. of you. I hear you. Uh, but thanks for being on the show. If you guys got some value from this, please share the show with somebody who maybe is just getting into sales. They, they, they need some of these tips and tricks. He really, you know, n- not all our guests break down tactical things you can actually implement immediately. And Jeremy did that for you. So share yeah. this show with somebody who needs it. We're out of here. Until next time, take care. From your hair. Peace. Peace.